It's uh, noon and uh, welcome all. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce a long time friend and colleague, Dr. Mala Venkatesan to you today. Uh, having gone through our master's degrees together, we went our separate ways, she to obtain a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we met again in the USA at NIH where for our postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, following this, she joined the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in 2004, and she rose through the ranks and retired just a few months ago as chief of the Department of Enteric Infection. For several years, she also served as an adjunct faculty to the George Washington University School of Medicine. So Dr. Venkatesan has been bestowed many honors as the foundation lecturer, American Society of Microbiology, she served as president of the Washington DC chapter for the ASM, as, that is the American Society of Microbiology, and was awarded the Health Sciences Award Washington DC and served as a member of several editorial boards. Her achievements uh, that have and will continue to have impact in healthcare field are many. Her strength has been to first decipher which genes are responsible for various aspects of infection in different strains of Shigella and then rationally design vaccines to disable those functions. She has led the field in this effort. She published the first virulence plasmid sequence in the sequence of the Shigella chromosome. The research team then constructed and tested three live attenuated orally administered Shigella vaccines, which are in phase one and two B clinical trials. And then they initiated and completed the de development of a second generation vaccine candidate. And of the four, two of them have now been selected for efficacy studies. We look forward to her talk today. We have all heard that the Army conducted key research in enteric diseases at Walter Reed. But today we will hear about how they did it and the immense impact of this research on healthcare throughout the world. Thank you, Mala. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sukumar Sarsa to me. Uh, this is also an honor and a privilege to be talking about not just bacterial diarrheal diseases vaccine development, but also overall the, uh, the involvement of the US military in infectious disease research, which I, which I hope I'll be able to convince you to some measure has been enormous. So <clears throat> Sam. If you can put the microphone closer, that would be helpful, Mala. The microphone closer. No, I'm trying. Okay. Also, uh, Dr. V, you can control Zoom anytime you want. I already okay. hand control it. I'm ready to do that. Okay. So let's skip through these first few slides. I don't know why I'm having this problem. It's not moving. Okay. So the obligatory slides. Okay, so I think that uh, war and disease as war and death have been interlinked for many, many years through history, through many civilizations. And uh, in this slide, you have a few interesting uh, observations by people, for example, dysentery in World War I, uh, Millions of people died of dysentery, soldiers uh, across both sides. Uh, and I particularly liked the American Revolutionary War uh, uh, quote at the bottom, which said that the surrender of Lord Cornwallis to George, General George Washington at Yorktown in 1781 was responsible for actually bringing an end to the American Revolutionary War and uh, the signing of the Treaty of Paris, and of course, to the formation of the United States of America as we know it. So uh, as I said, disease and war have played a huge role in, in, in our history. So until World War II, in fact, deaths due to infectious diseases outnumbered those due to direct combat injuries. Isn't that interesting? And why is that? It's because in fact, new recruits are trained in groups under crowded conditions, increasing the risk of spread of infectious agents. Deployed soldiers may come into contact with pathogens with which they have no prior experience and therefore no immunity. 
and war fighters, along with others, may face the intentional use of weaponized infectious agents. So uh, let me go back to this slide. So if you look at here, I just said that up until World War II, when the ratio of the death due to non-combat injuries were lower than death due to combat injuries, up until then, you know, you can see from the table that more people died of disease than they died of combat injuries, which is interesting. And since then, of course, with, with antibiotics and anesthetics and the large numbers of vaccines that are available, today we have a much lower death rate from disease than previously. So another interesting fact here is that the US military is second in public and private sector contributions to vaccine research and development. So as you look, Merck, has made contributed to the largest number of vaccines. Next is the US Army, followed by a bunch of other pharmaceutical companies. And out of the 98 total innovative vaccines that have been developed, 67 of them are to inactivated or subunit vaccines, and 31 are to live vaccines. And among the viral vaccines, influenza, adeno, and poliovirus account for almost half of those. And amongst the bacterial vaccines, pneumococcal, meningitis, pertussis, and tetanus account for almost half. I'm having a little trouble with this, moving to the next slide. Okay. Uh, okay, so today, the Army Research Centers uh, are headquartered in Fort Detrick, as you all know, uh, in 1994, uh, the United States Army Medical Research and Development uh, Command was restructured to establish the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command, which structured the command to manage the medical material acquisition program. This word acquisition is something that we heard a lot about when I was uh, at Walter Reed in support of the Army of the 21st century. And there are nine subordinate commands that are located throughout the world. Now, why is this? Why do I mention it? I mention this because these are some of the army's greatest resources to have these uh, hospitals and training grounds and places where the army has a foothold, where from where it gathers epidemiological studies, it gathers strains, it gathers reagents. All of this has gone to make the army a great place to do infectious disease research, including the fact of the clinical trials, which in many, many cases, as you will see, the army was involved in actually carrying out the clinical trial. For example, the latest HIV vaccine, that was the, that was the first large scale efficacy study that was done in Thailand and it was done by the army because of its many resources. So the US Army research prior to the era of bacteriology was primarily preventive, preventive in case, because we didn't know the etiology of the various diseases. In the colonial period, after the founding of the first English colony, Sir John Pringle, who was a British uh, scientist, found, and he was founder of the modern military medicine and the Red Cross concept, he reformed military medicine and sanitation because it was obvious to the military officers uh, and others that there was a great deal of connection between the way the soldiers lived and worked and disease and death. And the diseases seen during that period are listed over here. Uh, in 1721, the introduction of variolation among smallpox was the first deliberative active immunization against an infectious disease. And uh, James Lynn's observations that various dietary treatments of British sailors with scurvy could be relieved by eating lots of citrus fruits. Now in 1775, the Second Continental Congress appointed General George Washington as commander in chief. One of his first communications was to urge the Congress to make a hospital because there were no hospitals at the time. And in fact, after the defeat of the British uh, and the surrender at Yorktown, Congress rapidly demobilized the army. 
Uh, no additional military force or medical organization was authorized by Congress until 1808. And again in 1812, when a second war with Great Britain appeared inevitable, but then happened. Between 1800 and 1812, very little information is available concerning the medical service of the army. There was no central organization of the medical staff. There was no hospital department which George Washington wanted and sanitation in the modern sense did not exist. The average soldier was without medicines or medical attendants and recovered from illness by the strength of his own physical resistance or died in misery. But because perhaps of this, Sam, can you advance it to the next slide? Okay. Because of this lack of, uh, you know, real medical develop, I mean, medical developments, uh, there were two outstanding things that happened. The first American medical book was written in 1775, and the first American pharmacopoeia was written in 1778, and both were written by military officers. The, the American medical book was written by John Jones, who was uh, inspired by Sir John Pringle, the person I mentioned in the last slide. And this was published in America for the young military surgeons of the Continental Army. And uh, the people who were very much involved with the help of the soldier was General George Washington himself, uh, Major General Baron Steuben, Benjamin Rush, and Dr. James Tilton. These are all very uh, important names in the field of the United States Army and preventive medicine. Uh, and the first American pharmacopoeia also was filed by uh, American medical officers as early as 1778. And among the prescriptions were three preparations of Peruvian bark for use in the treatment of intermittent fevers. This is a very important observation because this Peruvian bark eventually was what was used to extract quinine for malaria in Europe. Uh, the Peruvian bark were used by Andes uh, Indians for uh, treatment of intermittent fever. But as you know, malaria also goes through intermittent fevers. And so they tried it and it actually worked. So uh, another astonishing thing that happened during this time was that the, uh, in 1818, the Surgeon General provided medical and scientific books for surgeons at army posts, and he retained one copy for himself. Well, eventually this collection became the great library of the Surgeon General's office and later, this vast collection of books and journals, documents, and manuscripts became the National Library of Medicine, which came under the administration of the Public Health Service. So in 1777, something remarkable happened. Uh, the United States uh, decided to introduce a vaccination with variolation compulsory for recruits for smallpox. This was a first. And if you know, smallpox was a great cause of thousands of soldiers and thousands of civilians dying. Uh, smallpox was generally prevalent in the Continental Army during the first two years of the Revolutionary War. In 1776, hundreds died for it. Now, Dr. Benjamin Rush was a great advocate of this vaccine, this process of vaccine. And so he told George Washington to promote inoculation or variolation, which means taking the infected wounds from one person and putting it in the other. Now later, Edward Jenner in 1798, you've all heard about him, he published the account of his discovery that active immunization of man against smallpox could be attained by artificial induction of cowpox which is a variant of variola, which causes smallpox in humans. And so around 1812, vaccination with cowpox became a generally accepted method for the prevention of smallpox among both military and civilian personnel. This brilliant success of the smallpox vaccination inspired the concept of eradication of communicable diseases later. So these are some pictures from the CDC, and you can see what a horrible disease it was. So moving on to uh, two other wars, uh, these were not very, uh, uh, lots, not, not too many soldiers were involved in this, but in the Mexican war and the Crimean wars, the, the disease, the, the thing that really uh, resulted in mortality among the soldiers was uh, sanitation. 
so you can see here in the Mexican war, there were seven deaths of diseases of the camp to one death caused by battle injury. And the main disease during the Mexican war was dysentery. This was followed by, by the Crimean war where it was fought mainly by the English. And again, immeasurable suffering resulted from shortages of food, clothing and shelter and from sickness due to dysentery, cholera, scurvy and typhus fever. And you can see that no matter which war it was, diarrhea and dysentery were a scourge for the soldiers because they lived in horrible conditions. They lived in crowded trenches. They used to have trench fever. Uh, they used to get infected. The infection would pass from uh, person to person. And at the time, people used to think this was all due to you know, bad air or mal air. That's how malaria, the word malaria came from mal air or foul air. And uh, you know the most versatile thing that came out of the Crimean War was Florence Nightingale. Uh, she created the modern profession of civilian and military nursing. And she also had uh, lots of things to say about public health and hygiene, hospital construction and management, medical statistics, and Indian and colonial health and welfare. And her work in the public health outnumber, I mean, actually have far wider implications in her work for nursing. So some of the army preventive principles of disease that developed during these wars were developed through trial and error and were stimulated by war. And this was that the responsibility for preserving the health of the troops depended upon the command. And uh, there was discipline was needed, uh, personal hygiene was emphasized, cleanliness, diet and nutrition, clothing and shoes. All of these things were primary principles then and they still are today in the public health. All of these ideas, good food, good nutrition, personal cleanliness, personal cleanliness avoiding exposure to extreme environments, uh, morale building, health education, immunization. At the time, the only immunization was for smallpox um, and others, as you can see. And this preventive principles of disease was uh, actually influenced by a sanitary movement that was first started in Britain, but then came to America. And the sanitary principles of the sanitary movement uh, was, uh, was uh, advocated by this person called Shattuck. And that sanitary movement involved a list of things that we have to do to, uh, from how we build our homes and how we place our latrines and where we put our water and how we purify water, et cetera, et cetera. Because up until then, we had no other way to fight disease other than prevent disease. The American Civil War was the beginning of the bacteriological era and scientific preventive medicine. So during the American Civil War, twice as, men, twice as many men died of disease as from battle wounds. And again, some of the diseases were acute and chronic diarrhea and dysentery, which occurred with more frequency and produced more sickness and mortality than any other form of disease. By that time, uh, oral administration of quinine sulfate was used as a chemo against malaria. And this marked the development of a new principle in preventive medicine. And this deserves special notice as one of the most valuable lessons from the Civil War. Uh, various diseases of the respiratory organs were seen, and these were important causes of ineffectiveness and mortality among the soldiers, and other diseases are listed below. Of course, venereal disease, syphilis, and gonorrhea was rampant. Uh, there was less smallpox, and there was a little yellow fever. So we then come into the, into the era when these three great giants of uh, science uh, worked, uh, Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, and Joseph Lister. Louis Pasteur, who described the germ theory, which was that every disease has a germ associated with it, basically. He did a lot of other studies too. Uh, and he also discovered that attenuated chicken cholera could protect against a virulent strain in an animal model. That was a very important observation at the time. Robert Koch, of course, uh, the Koch postulates, the four Koch postulates, he did a lot of his work with cholera, cholera bacteria. He grew it in culture and he determined guidelines to prove that a disease is caused by a specific organism. So Koch postulates are that you have to identify and isolate the organism. You have to show that can, it can cause disease in an animal. 
you can then have to show that you can take that animal, extract the organism from it, and put it into another animal so that it comes down with the disease. He had these, uh, these four postulates, identifying, culturing, showing that it causes disease, and showing that it can transmit the disease. So these became available during this time, the 1800s. And Joseph Lister, who was very much inspired by and influenced by uh, Louis Pasteur's work, he showed that uh, basically if you can cover war wounds uh, with uh, away from the air, which according to him contained a lot of organisms, uh, microorganisms or germs, then you could actually save the wound uh, and save the person. So this was the whole foundation of antiseptic surgery. Uh, and which according to him was the exclusion of all putrefactive organisms. So this was a very, very uh, exciting time because soon after this, people started to look for the etiology of the diseases that had so plagued the US military. Now you have to realize that although I'm talking about the US military, the civilians also suffered from these diseases. So it is because the military were at the forefront of uh, of having these diseases in much higher numbers because of the way the soldiers were placed and the way they worked and the stress that they felt, et cetera, in the war, that these diseases became more commonly seen amongst the military, but they were also seen in civilian world, obviously. So this led to the great era of bacteriology. During this time, several other things also helped. Uh, the use of ether as a general anesthetic, followed by the uh, testing of chloroform, which was a complete success. So ether and chloroform came so you could anesthetize um, uh, soldiers. Uh, Theobald Smith showed that toxoids against diphtheria can protect in guinea pigs. So toxins were known, but they didn't know how to uh, treat uh, toxins. Uh, Ernest Goodpasture introduces the use of Helen Courier allantoic membrane to cultivate virus. This was very important. In fact, uh, the influenza vaccines later on used this Helen allantoic membrane to culture viruses. Uh, later, uh, novel cell culture techniques to grow viruses came into being, uh, was, uh, was uh, published. And uh, I put in Rachel Snearson and John Robbins because they developed the first conjugate vaccine, but that led to a lot of better vaccines made for several diseases. So all of this, the development of anesthesia that it was very important for the US military and they were going on simultaneously or a little before or after the bacteriological era. So the Spanish-American War in 1898 marked the beginning of the US Army tropical medicine research. And why is that? Because this was the first time that American soldiers actually went out of the United States to fight a war. And now they got exposed to all these tropical diseases that uh, were for which they had very little immunity. Now, during the Spanish-American War, as you know, the US gained Cuba, Caribbean regions, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Philippines. Lots of people died. Uh, and uh, mainly typhoid in military camps. But in Cuba, soldiers also suffered from typhoid, diarrhea, dysentery, yellow fever, and malaria. So the Major General Grenville Dodge was so uh, upset with all this that he investigated uh, the conduct of the War Department in the war with Spain, and it led to a reorganization of the army, again, for remedy of sanitary deficiencies and prevention of their reoccurrence. Two great names in uh, military research, Brigadier General George Miller Sternberg, who was the 18th Surgeon General. He wrote the first manual of bacteriology in 1892, and he created what is known as the Walter Reed Shakespeare Vaughan Typhoid Fever Board. This board confirmed the fecal oral transmission of typhoid and determined that more soldiers died from typhoid than from yellow fever or battle wounds. In 1900, he formed the Yellow Fever Commission, headed by Major Walter Reed, who was his protege, which confirmed and extended earlier work on yellow fever transmission, which was shown to be due to mosquitoes. Together with Walter Reed, uh, Colonel Sternberg, General Sternberg, 
established the Army Medical School, which is now Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and the Army Nurse Corps. Now, Major Walter Reed joined the Army and then became the first professor of bacteriology and clinical microscopy at the Army Medical School, which had newly opened. And he showed that the recruits, military recruits stationed near the Potomac River got yellow fever through the bite of mosquitoes. In 1898, he traveled to Cuba under the direction of uh, Brigadier General Sternberg during the Spanish-American War and formed the Typhoid Vaccine Board. And as a result of his findings, the board promoted sanitary measures, including latrine policy, disinfection, camp relocation, and water sterilization. He returned from Cuba and he died in 1902. Now the work of Walter Reed uh, really led to the yellow fever eradication, which was a key to building the Panama Canal. As many of you know, uh, yellow fever is a systemic viral disease and it's endemic to Sub-Saharan Africa. And at the time it was endemic even to uh, Central and South America. Uh, and it caused an epidemic disease in, in American occupied areas. And it destroyed the French effort to build the Panama Canal because of the disease. It infected, uh, it infected everybody who was around the area where these marshes had abundant mosquitoes that were spreading this disease. So uh, the Yellow Fever Commission, which was headed by Walter Reed, showed that this agent that was causing the disease was a filterable virus transmitted by mosquitoes. And in 1903, under the guidance of Major William Gorgas, who later became the 22nd Surgeon General in Cuba near the Panama Canal Zone, he eliminated YF by destroying the marshes and destroying the mosquitoes. Uh, and he did so in 16 months. So later, uh, Tyler and Smith at Rockefeller passaged yellow fever virus in chick embryos and got an attenuated strain for vaccine development. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble. Okay. Sam, could I just uh, maybe prompt you to say, to put the next slide on if I say next slide? Sure thing. Okay, I think that will be easier because I think we're spending too much time just trying to, let me go back. Okay, so in World War One, so we've gone from the Spanish uh, uh, War to World War One, where again, you know, the mortality rates were huge. Uh, the majority of deaths were due to famine and disease. Um, horrific conditions on the front line meant fevers, parasites, and infection that ripped through the troops in the trenches. And I've listed a whole bunch of uh, diseases that were common. Uh, also remember that during this time, we, uh, we experienced the Spanish flu. So uh, next slide, please. Next slide, Sam. Yeah, so the Spanish flu was one of the worst epidemic in the US history, or at least we thought it was one of the worst flu epidemic till we got COVID today. But uh, around the world, 21 million deaths worldwide. Lots of people in the military, army, navy were hospitalized and died. Um, the first wave of the Spanish flu was milder and uh, the soldiers who were infected during the first wave actually carried the virus to Europe. Influenza cases outnumbered battle wounds, and the impact of the Spanish flu resulted in a large preventive public health program in World War II, with the Army um, Epidemiology Board Commission on Influenza and Vaccine. I'll talk about these commissions in a little while. Next slide, please. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the viruses that uh, is also transmitted by mosquitoes was a, a vaccine for that was developed by the Army. And this was in 1906, uh, when they examined blood specimens from dengue patients. Uh, dengue is also caused by a dengue virus. Uh, they did not find, uh, army researchers did not find blood uh, cultures. Blood cultures were negative. Uh, and vol volunteer studies showed that intravenous inoculation of blood transmitted dengue. And the intravenous filtered blood also transmitted dengue. So this was an ultra microscopic agent. At the time, this was the way they identified non-bacterial viral etiology. This work was done by Ashburn and Charles Craig, the first paper 
and they were both um, working for uh, working as army officers. And uh, immunity to dengue after recovery, 60% are immune. The remaining 40 types after challenge had shorter illness. These sorts of studies led to the current dengue vaccines, which are being developed against four different serotypes of dengue. But these studies have been going on for a long time and the army is still involved in doing, and there is no dengue vaccine as such. So the army is still involved in working on both inactivated dengue vaccines and live dengue vaccines. Next slide, please. Now, another uh, big uh, uh, eradication program that was uh, that the military was responsible for was the inactivated typhoid vaccine. As you saw, typhoid was rampant uh, in military camps, in military recruits, and in wars. So, um, in uh, there was a killed typhoid vaccine. The first one was made in UK. Uh, Captain Frederick Russell was asked to go to UK and learn how to make this typhoid vaccine. So he came back and he created a sub-Q form of the right typhoid vaccine, whole cell phenol killed vaccine. And by 1911, all US military were getting typhoid vaccine. In 1914, the first US typhoid vaccine was licensed thanks to the military work. And after that, they had what is called a triple typhoid vaccine, TAB against Salmonella typhi, Salmonella paratyphi A, Salmonella paratyphi B, all of which substantially reduced typhoid cases and deaths. Another important discovery in the field of typhoid was made by Dr. Joseph Smadrill, who worked under Walter Reed as the chief of the virus and rickettsial diseases, and he showed that typhoid could be treated with an antibiotic chloramphenicol. And later, in 1984, Steve Hoffman in the US Navy showed that dexamethasone could be used to treat the delirium during typhoid. So, Today, we have all kinds of antibiotics, but we also have a live vaccine, a live Salmonella typhi vaccine. Again, and it was uh, tested by DOD funding, and we also have a conjugate vaccine uh, for typhoid. Next, next slide, please. So another important thing that happened during this time, early to mid 1900s, is the discovery and mass production of antibiotics that greatly helped war wound infections and also helped the civilian world. Uh, so it started off with Paul Ehrlich's work where he showed that certain dyes can kill, selectively kill certain bacteria. And in 1928, Alexander Fleming made a serendipitous uh, discovery of penicillin. And by D-Day in 1944, penicillin was being widely used to treat troops for infections. And these sorts of discoveries brought the, uh, the disease death to more manageable uh, situation. So, uh, and of course, uh, Fleming, Howard Florian, and Ernest Jane were awarded the Nobel Prize for their penicillin research. So this was another uh, event that happened at the time that all the other uh, diseases were being uh, described and the etiology was being described. Next slide, please. In World War II, as I said, in World War II, for the first time, there were fewer diseases fewer deaths due to disease than to combat injuries. Still, you can see the diseases that were prevalent on the left-hand side and the diseases that you saw in the war zones. Again, trench foot, trench fever. Trench fever turned out to be due to lice infected clothes. You know, the soldiers used to be crammed together and there used to be lice all over their clothes and they used to pass it from people to people, person to person, and it caused a lot of morbidity and mortality. Typhoid was still there, typhus fever, influenza, malaria, BD, TB, shell shock, in that order. Uh, so uh, World War II, of course, by this time, as I said, we had anesthesia, we had antibiotics, we had some vaccines. So the morbidity and mortality due to diseases was coming down. Next slide, please. So after World War II, the army decided to have a board that will address critical medical issues of military importance through various commissions, which performed basic and field investigations of military medical problems related to epidemiology and preventive medicine. This was a very important uh, board that was set up. It was first the Army Epidemiological Board, and later it became a tri-service board and came to be known as the Armed Forces Epidemiological Board. Next slide. The unique 
feature of this board was that it would look at infectious diseases that confront deployed soldiers, along with questions on military healthcare delivery system, prevention of chronic diseases, and the results after many years, the AFED boards existed till 1972 or 1974. At the end of it, definitely there was improvement of the health programs for the military, morbidity and mortality was reduced, readiness mission was attained, and new research initiatives led to further prevention of disease and injury. So why was this AFEV so good? This was really uh, what made the Army, Army and Navy, when I say Army, I mean Army and Navy, military, uh, be so good at combating diseases. Next slide. These commissions, so you had the Army, you had the military providing support, providing uh, encouragement, providing uh, research grants, to civilians, these commissions were comprised primarily of civilian experts in the field to study specific military medical problems. And the commission accomplishments included the development of vaccines against influenza, adeno, Japanese encephalitis virus, typhoid, and the treatment and prevention of pneumonia, hepatitis, meningitis, rheumatic fever, tetanus, and diphtheria. On the left-hand side of this panel, I have a whole bunch of commissions individual commissions, which were uh, the board members of which were highly well-known civilian scientists in the academic world. So there was a wonderful collaboration between the, arm, between the military, uh, uh, military departments and the civilian world, which led to the development of so many vaccines. As I said, the military has contributed next to Merck, the second most number of vaccines that are in use today. And it happened, I think a lot of it was because of this wonderful collaboration between these two giant uh, uh, agencies. Next slide, please. And uh, I have some of the names of the people who were the board presidents of individual. These commissions changed from time to time, depending upon what was, uh, what was on the agenda for the army, for the military. Uh, and as you can see, these are some of the people uh, Commission on Epidemiological Survey, uh, Dr. Bain Jones was actually one of the people who started the AFEB. At the top, you have the Commission on Influenza by Thomas Francis. He was the one uh, uh, who actually developed the first flu vaccine, um, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So in World War II and after, uh, new research initiatives targeted influenza, bacterial meningitis, bacterial pneumonia, measles, mumps, and other tropical diseases. It was not until World War II that many basic concepts were plucked from the lab. In 1941, as I said, the U.S. Army organized a commission to develop the first flu vaccine because of its experience in 1898, I mean, in 1914 during World War I, when so many millions of people died all over the world. So the first flu, uh, the army virologist Thomas Francis and his team gained FDA approval for the influenza A vaccine in less than two years. Francis used a virus, H1N1 strain from hen allantoic fluid, which made this virus in high titers, and he was able to purify and inactivate with formerly. Now, Thomas Francis was in the University of Michigan and he was on the commission for the influenza. And he worked with uh, DOD uh, who funded his work and uh, collaborated with him to develop the first licensed flu vaccine in the US. And then in 1940, Thomas Francis also discovered influenza B, which is antigenically distinct from influenza A. And I will not go through the various st stages because you know uh, that uh, this uh, influenza goes through shifts and drifts. And so these are changes in either the HA, the H, which stands for HA, hemagglutinin and N, which stands for neuraminidase, neuraminidase. And these undergo shifts and drifts. And depending upon what is circulating, the influenza vaccine keeps changing. So today we are up to a tetravalent vaccine, which is three different, two different types of um, A, influenza A, combined with, I think, two different types of influenza B. Next slide, please. So uh, I have over here two pioneers in infectious disease research. They did a lot of work on 
viruses. So on the top, I have Gunnell Harry Plot uh, Pauls. No, it should be Plot. I'm sorry. Yeah, Harry Plot, who established the first viral endotetsin diagnostic lab at the Army Medical School and whose objectives were to conduct and improve methods for diagnosis and prevention of viral and rickettsial communicable diseases. And so diagnosis of influenza, aseptic meningitis, the various equine encephalitis, rabies, polio, mumps, and measles. We had diagnostic kits for all of them. In 1945 to 1946, Smardle, Joseph Smardle, took over as chief of the Division of Viral and Rickettsial Diseases and under his guidance, RARE continued to be one of the leading institutes for studies of infectious disease. He led a very broad spectrum of bacterial, rickettsial, and virus studies to diagnose, prevent, and treat these diseases, including the ones that are listed. And he also showed, as I mentioned, that chloramphenicol treatment uh, of scrub typhus and typhoid could be used to remedy these diseases. That was a very important observation. Um, for his work, he received the Lasper Clinical Research Award. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail because I just talked about it, but I have this slide in case uh, there's an, some people who want to know how the different types of influenza vaccines came into being. Next slide, please. Uh, another uh, vaccine that the U.S. military helped to develop from the beginning, in other, words, in other words, identifying the organisms to the development of the vaccine, is the meningococcal vaccine. Meningococcus is a bacteria, and it's an important cause of bacterial meningitis and sepsis. Five serogroups are responsible for nearly all invasive meningococcal disease. And in 1968 to 72, there were three authors, three uh, strong investigators at Walter Reed, Gottschlick, Artenstein, and Goldschneider, they published five papers uh, describing research that led to vaccines against meningococcal serogroup A and C polysaccharide-based vaccines. Uh, and again, I, I'm not going to go through all of the, of the steps that led to, but in 1974, the FDA licensed three vaccines for limited use only, and in 1978, the military was routinely using the bivalent serogroup A plus C vaccine for meningococcal. Now today we have a tetravalent meningococcal vaccine against four of the five serogroups. Uh, in 1999, the polysaccharide based vaccine was, uh, I won't say replaced, but we had a polysaccharide conjugate vaccine, which was uh, introduced in the UK. And uh, today, uh, FDA has licensed protein polysaccharide conjugate vaccines against the four serotypes. Now, when I was in uh, Walter Reed, they were trying to make a vaccine against serogroup B, which has been very difficult because serogroup B has certain antigens that have molecular mimicry with certain human antigens. So it, it took a much longer time, but I think now Pfizer and Merck have two vaccines against serogroup B. So meningococcal vaccine is a great uh, victory for military research. Uh, and one of the things that I would like to say is that when I say military, you know, it's a huge agency. It has lab, scientific labs where things are discovered, investigated, proteins and viruses are characterized, and animal models are built up, et cetera, et cetera. Then it makes a vaccine that it thinks is going to work. Then it can test them in animal models. It can manufacture because the uh, the army had its own manufacturing capabilities, and then the army has this enormous uh, resource to test vaccines in clinical trials, in small phase one studies, in phase two studies, and in large phase three studies, as the recent HIV vaccine showed. And this requires a team. Vaccine development requires a huge team. It's not just, as you know, just in, you know, identifying something at the bench and, and then not doing anything requires a huge team and it requires resources, it requires reagents, it requires collaborations across uh, many, many different disciplines, uh, all of which the US, United States military has in abundance. And it, and it shows, and I think is one of the main reasons why it has been able to develop so many vaccines today. Next slide, please. Just two pictures. I should have had a picture of the current Walter Reed, but on the right-hand side, this is the Walter Reed where I spent 
the first 15 years of my life. Uh, it was a beautiful building, but an old building. And then the Army Research, Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and the Naval Medical Research uh, moved into one building uh, off of uh, Forest Glen. I'm sorry, <laughs> I have pictures of it, but I don't have pictures of it here. Next slide. Another thing that another vaccine that the army should be, that the military should be very proud of is the live oral adenovirus type four and seven vaccines. Uh, again, uh, it cost 70%, adenovirus cost 70% of respiratory illness in military recruits. The inactivated virus vaccine was licensed by Hilleman and Bob Chanak at NIH along with DOD help showed that adenovirus will induce an asymptomatic immunizing infection when administered live by the enteric route. This gave rise to the first oral live adenovirus type 4 vaccine, which was safe and highly effective in military recruits. And subsequent trials revealed the need for type adenovirus 7 and possibly a need for a type adenovirus 21. So uh, the combined vaccines, type four and seven, have been tested by the military in uh, several phase one and phase two trials. Uh, and then a live adenoviral vaccine was prepared and tested uh, and were approved by the FDA in 1980. And uh, the YF was actually manufacturing this vaccine. Uh, it was very important for reducing uh, respiratory illness in uh, military recruits. But then why it stopped, and in 2000, uh, the manufacture of the bivalent type 4 and 7 was resumed when DOD gave the contract to Bar Labs, which is known as TIVA today. And in 2019, FDA again approved the new live adenoviral 4 and 7 vaccine. And this is, an, again, an example like the, uh, like the uh, flu vaccine or the dengue vaccine of the resources that the military has to do these vaccines, to make these vaccines, to develop these vaccines as needed. Uh, next slide, please. So another vaccine that the military research should be very proud of is the hepatitis A virus vaccine. So the viral etiology, and this, this uh, vaccine was almost, the work was almost done by the military researchers from almost the beginning to the end. So uh, they identified the hepatitis A virus, they showed it to grow in cell culture, they developed an owl monkey model and a radio immunoassay in cell cultures for infectivity titration that was very important. Uh, they then cultivated in suitable cells for vaccine production. This was done by Lenny Bin. Lenny Bin is still around. I'm very glad to say uh, he is uh, 90 plus, but he still shows up at the lab every day. <laughs> and uh, so they made a inactivated HAV vaccine, hepatitis A virus vaccine. Uh, and uh, in um, 1995, FDA approved the first HAV inactivated vaccine that was made in cell culture. In 1996, it was approved for human use. All of this was done mostly by dollars from the DOD by the military. Next slide, please. Maurice Hilleman uh, is often known as father of vaccinology. He spent a few years at Walter Reed and he demonstrated the shift and drift of influenza virus. After he worked in Walter Reed, he went to Mark. And from what I understand, the lessons he learned in the military in those years, that is that you have to tell scientists to work on the vaccine or else was very important for him because when he went to Merck, that's exactly what he did. It's this, these are the stories that we've heard about him. He was prolific. He contributed to the development of over 40 vaccines. Some of those vaccines at Merck was done in association, like the meningococcal vaccine was done in association with, uh, with the army, but he was again, a huge figure in vaccinology. Next slide, please. So the question is, you know, military research made significant contributions to eight of 14 new vaccines licensed in the second half of the 20th century. How did it do it and why did it do it? So not only did it make six, uh, significant contributions to new vaccines, it also contributed to improvements in several vaccines, including influenza, combined diphtheria, tetanus, cholera, smallpox, typhoid. Next slide, please. 
So why? It, because military needs drove vaccine development. Wartime programs like the Flu Commission developed or improved a total of 10 vaccines for diseases of military significance, some in time to meet the objectives of particular operations. Now, some of these vaccines may be crude by today's standards, but they set certain uh, guidelines for improved vaccines to come. And uh, for example, uh, there's an example here, botulinum toxoid was mass produced prior to D-Day in response to a faulty intelligence that Germany had loaded V1 bombs with the toxin. Japanese encephalitis vaccine was developed in anticipation of an allied land invasion of Japan. So military needs drove vaccine development. Next slide. Political and military interests influenced both the direction of vaccine research and the rate of innovation. So military's presence in Africa, Southeast Asia, East Asia, directed resources towards tropical diseases such as malaria and dengue fever that were of little commercial interest to US pharmaceutical companies. Nonetheless, the United States Army Navy had programs, huge programs for malaria and dengue fever that are still existing today. Uh, the malaria program has been there for 50 years. And actually, it's a very, very, uh, very um, good program because it did make the first licensed malaria vaccine. Dengue fever, we are still working on it. Uh, Walter Reed is still working on dengue fever. And uh, RARE and the AFEB board enhanced the epi and clinical competencies through a network of international labs and field stations. This infrastructure facilitated efforts to improve JEV, typhoid, and cholera vaccines by working directly with the population most affected. And this was seen during the, you know, one of the examples is the recent HIV vaccine trial, which happened in Thailand. 16,000 uh, volunteers or, or 16,000 people participated in that vaccine program. It could only have been done by the army because they have all of these teams and reagents and strains and procedures and diagnostics and SOPs in place to carry out these sorts, of, um, uh, these sorts of clinical trials. Next slide, please. How did these programs develop so many vaccines so fast, you may say? Well, military and civilian scientists collaborated. Nonprofit contracts were from the DOD was given to scientists and to manufacturers. Vaccine development was considered war effort. It was public duty. So all these uh, you know, IP restrictions, and uh, you know, uh, was not there. There were less of a barrier then than it is today. Uh, steady and quick translation of lab findings into working products is something that has really gone out the door today. It takes a long time to get things from the bench to the uh, to, to phase one studies. Uh, Top-down integration of project management across multi-disciplines, and then cooperative duty-driven approach to vaccine development that persisted into the post-war era, contributing to high rates of vaccine innovation through the middle of the 20th century. However, a series of legal, economic, and political transformations disrupted this collaboration and new vaccine development have stalled and some existing vaccines were discontinued, unfortunately. One can have many reasons. You can think of many reasons. There are much higher FDA bars for a vaccine to clear many more rules and regulations, policies and procedures, uh, collaborations are not as easy. Uh, you cannot go into a meeting now and give a strain to somebody, uh, take a Petri dish out of your pocket and give it to somebody. Those days are gone. Uh, it's lots of paperwork, lots of regulations, lots of rules. So uh, much slower development of vaccines today. Next slide. So I've listed us, uh, some scientific contributions of the AFEB until 1994. Some of them I've talked to you about already. Hepatitis, uh, A vaccines, oral vaccines for adenovirus, uh, demonstration that penicillin and tetracycline prevent certain types of diseases, um, typhus vaccine and inactivated in living vaccines for typhoid fever. Uh, so you can look at this. Uh, uh, look at this list later, but the, but the contributions were enormous and enormous across many, many different types of diseases. Next slide, please. This is a list of some of the viral vaccines that were developed, produced, and or tested at RARE. And lots of these equine encephalitis. These vaccines were not really given to everybody. They are available and they were given to lab personnel during World War II who were isolating and working on these. Uh, a Japanese encephalitis uh, vaccine has been given to military 
uh, in Okinawa, uh, and a bunch of other viruses which were both characterized at in the military labs and then vaccines were produced, hepatitis A, hepatitis E, smallpox, I've talked about these. Next slide, please. So there was an enteric disease commission also, because as you saw, diarrhea and dysentery were abundant. And so an enteric disease commission was formed and the commission would direct studies on bacteriology, parasitology, virology, epidemiology, and specific investigations that cause diarrheal disease. And the first thing in 1949 is they decided to target Salmonella and Shigella. Next slide, please. So the AFEB over its years, 1951 to 72, studied on a variety of things. They studied on pathogenesis, they studied on live vaccine, live and kin vaccine, depart, uh, vaccine development. They worked on entamoeba, which causes amoebic dysentery. They worked on cholera, ORS, viral gastroenteritis, rotavirus, norovirus, animal model development. They looked at role of copro antibodies and probiotics to gut immunity. All of these things are very important today. They looked at the ecology of the gastrointestinal tract. A great figure in that area was Dr. Vene J. Dubois who did some pioneering work. Uh, they also looked at epidemiology and field testing of, uh, of uh, vaccine candidates, investigated outbreaks, looked at antibiotic resistance and tested new drugs for, uh, for treatment. One of the uh, very well-known microbiologists who spent several years at Walter Reed uh, looking at Salmonella mainly was Dr. Stanley Falco, who then continued to have a very successful and inspiring career at Stanford and inspired many, many young microbiologists to take up the mantle. Next slide, including me. Next slide, please. So cholera, cholera was another success case for the military. As you know, cholera is caused by a bacteria called Vibrio cholerae. Uh, it can enter and it releases its toxin, cholera toxin, which then enters the cell. The toxin enters the cell and causes um, uh, the release of water and electrolytes. So the, the army uh, did a lot, of, the US military, then here the army Navy uh, did a lot of work on the eradication of cholera, or at least the, the treatment of cholera. Uh, so the oral rehydration therapy was, uh, was the work of a Navy physician, very famous Navy physician who did this work in Cairo uh, at a Navy lab, Commander Robert Phillips. Uh, and today, oral rehydration solution has brought down the mortality due to cholera by almost 90% uh, in places where it is used properly. Uh, this is, again, a remarkable success story because cholera, I mean, I know of my, uh, you know, relatives uh, two generations ago who died of cholera. Uh, so this was a huge, and cholera came in pandemics, you know, almost every seven or eight years, there would be a pandemic of cholera that would start in the Indian Gangetic plane and then go east and west and, and, and destroy many, many lives. Next slide, please. So the major contribution of cholera was, as I said, you have a picture of uh, uh, Commander Phillips on the, on the top, and that's Commander Phillips on the right, extreme right, uh, at a fever hospital in Cairo. So he showed that isotonic electrolyte solution with glucose could be given to rehydrate cholera patients and it served this ORS therapy has saved and continues to save hundreds of millions of lives. Uh, at RARE, we had uh, uh, Richard Finkelstein, who is uh, also uh, still uh, alive, <laughs> and uh, he, he isolated and characterized a cholera toxin, AB toxin, A subunit and five B subunits together make the cholera AB toxin. And he showed and provided evidence that Vibrio cholera was not invasive and did not interrupt the mucosal tissues, showing that a localized biochemical defect resulted in the massive fluid efflux in cholera, and that was due to the cholera toxin. And he performed, uh, the, um, the army performed multiple trials of cholera vaccines. Next slide, please. So now we come to cause of traveler's diarrhea. So traveler's diarrhea today is caused mainly by bacteria. And the three bacteria that we see is enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is an E. coli with toxins, Shigella, which is the one I work in, and Campylobacter jejuni, which is uh, commonly present in many people and is asymptomatic, but it can become symptomatic when uh, under the right conditions. 
Uh, and of course, traveler's diarrhea is also caused by viruses. You have rotavirus, you have norovirus. We have a rotavirus vaccine. Uh, the army has been involved in the clinical trials of uh, a couple of noroviral vaccines and parasites such as um, entamoeba histolytica. Next slide, please. So why do we work on diarrheal disease today? Uh, because diarrheal disease uh, is one of 10 top global causes of death, even in 2000, this was taken in 2016, and you can see diarrheal diseases. It is still a major cause of disease and death. And if you look on the right-hand side in low-income countries, it is the second highest uh, cause of uh, death in low-income countries. So diarrheal diseases uh, is an important, um, uh, important area of work for, uh, for both the military and others. Next slide, please. So the current vaccine development against bacterial diarrhea is against ETEC, Shigella, and Jejun. Together, they cause 50 to 60% of cases in US troops. And almost, uh, you know, 50% of the troops who've gone to Operation Iraqi Freedom or Afghanistan, wherever, they come down with diarrhea. It is very, very common. And it actually, uh, you know, I have some demographics that shows that 45% uh, of the troops that were in either um, Iraqi or Afghanistan uh, experience an episode of diarrhea severe enough to decrease job performance for a median of three days. And 67 to 62% of those subjects sought medical care for diarrheal illness. Uh, so for nearly one third of troops with diarrhea, treatment included IV rehydration. And you know, this can uh, present a huge logistical problem for the US military when it's deployed and now it has to fight these wars. So uh, the program goal was to develop an effective vaccine and other countermeasures against the leading causes of infectious diarrhea. So the current candidates are a live attenuated Shigella vaccine, an artificial Invaplex Shigella vaccine, an ETEC Fimbrial adhesin based vaccine, and a Campylobacter capsule conjugate vaccine. Next slide, please. So the Army ETEC vaccine, which was headed by Stephen Saverino, uh, who was in the Navy and who's now at uh, Pasteur, uh, is based upon the fact that uh, these uh, strains have fimbria and these fimbria have these very specific adhesins and the fimbria and the adhesins together form a very good target antigen. So it's a multivalent vaccine is being developed. Uh, and this is just shows you the, the, the red, the red the, in these uh, graphics are the adhesins and the, the blues and the grays are homologous regions in different types of fimbri. There are many, many types of fimbri. Uh, so uh, what you can do is take the ones that are most prevalent, the E. coli that's more prevalent, and then try to form a vaccine. So there has been one phase one study and a phase two B efficacy study. And I think uh, more efficacy, more phase one trials are in the pipeline. Uh, there is a whole cell killed multivalent vaccine that has been made by Anne-Marie Swinnerham at Sweden. And that uh, initial studies of that is uh, promising. Next slide, please. Sam, how much time do I have? Um, at this point, it's uh, 1.03 p.m. Um, I mean... I, I may take another 10 minutes. 10 minutes is perfectly fine. Okay, terrific. So the current Campy vaccine efforts are directed towards a bacterial capsule polysaccharide. So Campylobacter jejuni, uh, which is the main, most commonly isolated Campylobacter that causes disease, is, uh, has a capsule. And the capsule is the one which forms the target for the vaccine. So uh, a capsule vaccine has been manufactured and it will undergo trial in the near future. Next slide, please. So Shigella, finally we come to Shigella. Uh, so Shigella is a terrible disease because it causes dysentery and those uh, in my lab and in other labs at Walter Reed, once in a while people do come with this, come down. It's a very low infectious dose. As little as 10 to 100 bacteria can cause disease and they have ended up in hospitals and they told me that it was awful. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was known to the Hippocrates, Hippocrates, Dysentery means bad bowels and uh, it, you, know, you, you get fever, you get acute abdominal pain and cramps, you get tenesmus uh, sometimes and acute constitutional problems. Uh, next slide, please. 
So a GEM study was done by the Center for Vaccine Development in Baltimore. And what they showed was that if you target uh, five pathogens, Shigella, ste tech rotavirus, cryptosporidium, and typical enteropathogenic E. coli, you can substantially reduce the burden of moderate to severe diarrhea in children uh, zero to five years of age, because it is in this group, zero to five years of age, that uh, Shigella is most, uh, causes the most disease. Uh, this study was done, uh, as I said, at CVD, and uh, some very uh, good uh, information came out of it. So today, uh, if you look at the Shigella that is prevalent in the world, I think there's a consensus opinion that a tetravalent vaccine against three different subtypes of Shigella flexneri and Shigella sonii, which has only a single subtype, is what is needed for a tetravalent vaccine. So next slide, please. Uh, Shigella, one of the main things that was shown is that Shigella, unlike cholera, actually penetrates the colonic mucosa and it multiplies and spreads intercellularly to cause an acute inflammation. And you can see what happens to the, um, to the intestine, uh, which has been infected with a wild type. And then this is what, this is what your normal intestinal villa looks like. Uh, this has been infected with a, a non-invasive uh, pathogen. So there's a big difference. And uh, this epithelial cell invasion was shown to be critical for virulence. Next slide, please. So the person who really started it all and was a towering influence at Institute and, and elsewhere is Dr. Sam Formal, who did all of the early studies on characterizing Shigella strains, making antibodies to them, setting up animal models, including monkeys, showing that if you infect monkeys with a Shigella flexneri, you can protect against Shigella flexneri, but you cannot protect against Shigella sonii. These studies set down the hypothesis that LPS, bacterial lipopolysaccharide, which covers, which is on the outer surface of the bacteria, is responsible for this serotypic protection and also is an important antigen. And he did many, many different types of Shigella vaccines, live Shigella vaccines with mixed results. One of his protégés, Philippe Sansonetti, then came to study Shigella in his laboratory in 79 to 81, and he showed that a large plasmid is critical for epithelial cell invasion. And of course, once the plasmid was discovered, everybody jumped in and started to dissect the plasmid out. And today, we know almost the functions of many of the genes that are encoded on this, on this particular plasmid. Philippe Sansonetti actually went to Pasteur Institute and set up his own lab and became a huge uh, personality in the field of microbial pathogenesis. He set down many firsts that are still being followed in all of the other gram-negative and gram-positive bacterial pathogens. So he's a great inspiration to everybody working on microbial pathogenesis today. Next slide, please. So on this invasion associated, uh, on this large plasmid, there is a 31 KB region that is uninterrupted by any insertion elements, which is a very common feature on this plasmid. And this allows the bacteria to use what is called a type three secretion system, which is uh, made up of all these proteins, uh, mixed C proteins, PA proteins, and the IPG proteins to put these antigens, IPA, A, B, C, D, you see here in red, onto the surface of the bacteria. When the bacteria comes into contact with the epithelial cells, it makes a hole in the host cell and then inserts or translocates these proteins into the bacteria and other proteins, highly regulated, uh, uh, scheme of events, and then it starts to multiply. It comes out of the phagosome, multiplies, spreads, and causes disease. Now, there is another protein here, B or G, which is required after invasion. So it helps the bacteria to move around and to move from cell to cell. So next slide. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, Ed Oaks is uh, somebody who showed that you could actually assay for this intercellular spread by doing a kind of a viral plaque assay. He did a bacterial plaque assay, and this is used a very important assay for us to use to look for virulence and virulence mutations. So next slide, please. So what happens is that you see VRG recruits host actin filaments, forms a plaque, and if you put that particular strain into a guinea pig eye, you get a positive, very strong inflammatory reaction. We expect this is what goes on at the inter lower intestine and colon. 
If you remove the BRG, you get a negative serine reaction. So this became a target for a live Shigella vaccine. Next slide, please. So we made a first generation live attenuated Shigella vaccine by uh, the loss of BRG ICSA. We made it of three different serotypes. This one was actually made in Philippe Sansonetti's lab at Pasteur. He sent it to us. We manufactured it and tested it and showed that it is efficacious. And that was the first proof of concept for the BRG-based uh, vaccines. Uh, the WRSS1 and WRSV1 made from Shigella sonii and Shigella dysentery 1 were made and manufactured and tested by, um, by, uh, by us uh, here in Israel, in Thailand, in Bangladesh. Uh, and we have, uh, it, what we have learned from this is that, next slide please, that these first generation vaccines worked great, but they needed a little bit more tweaking. There was a little bit in 20% of the volunteers, we saw some fever and we saw some mild diarrhea not lasting for more than 24 hours. So we needed to tweak these strains a little bit more. And by this time, we also came to know that on the plasmid, there were enterotoxins that were expressed. So we decided to go in and make a second generation vaccine. Next slide, please which now have the loss of VRG in all of them, but it also has loss of these toxins. And in order to reduce the fever, we also decided to modify the bacterial LPS, which as you know, is a very strong endotoxin and can cause the fevers. So we have now made a tetravalent vaccine, three different subtypes of Shigella flexneri, which are prevalent in the world, Shigella sonii, which is just a single SIP type, and Shigella dysentery 1, which is the main epidemic Shigella. So we have two variations of each, and one which contains the LPS uh, modification and one which doesn't. And we took the Shigella sonii, and we recently completed a phase one study with SS2 and SS3 at Cincinnati Children's Health and Medical Center. It was safe and uh, up to 10 to the sixth CFU dose. We had a steering committee meeting and we wrote an, I, we wrote an IND and received FDA approval in April, 2019 for an efficacy trial with WRSS2, which is being sponsored by DMID and NIAID. Next slide, please. So what are the alternatives to vaccine? Well, clean water, sanitation, hand washing, antibiotics, uh, they're trying some types of uh, non-absorbable uh, antibiotics. And more recently, uh, they're trying phage cocktail and also um, bovine gamma globulins. I, I have to say this, that uh, last year, the army decided to uh, stall the bacterial diarrheal vaccine program altogether. Uh, although we have these trials in place and these will happen because they are being sponsored by outside agencies. But they stalled it because they said it's taking too long. And also because I think, as you can understand, warfare has changed. There are fewer people, fewer soldiers being sent to fight and, and many other things that help to keep the soldiers safe. Uh, and so the army uh, decided to stop the Shigella vaccine, Campylobacter vaccine, ETEC vaccine program, and also at the same time, stop the malaria vaccine program, which has actually been very successful. So these are things that we, that, you know, you get used to it because decisions are made based upon the needs of the military. And currently the needs of the military is to get something quick. So we are looking at bovine immunoglobulins, working with a commercial partner. Uh, we are injecting various strains of E. coli, Campy and Shigella into, into cows and extracting the uh, colostrum and testing those in monkeys and humans later on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are some references. The next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm just going to leave you with this uh, with this slide. You can look at it. I have talked about most of the vaccines that uh, the U.S. military has been involved in, from uh, typhoid vaccine to flu vaccine, yellow fever, smallpox, Japanese encephalitis, plague vaccine, typhoid vaccine, dengue adenoviral vaccine, hepatitis vaccine, recombinant CSP vaccine against malaria. Now the malaria is a very interesting story. Malaria vaccine, the army does not get a whole lot of credit sometimes, uh, unfortunately, but I think the malaria vaccine could not have been developed uh, without 
the huge amount of work that people have put into uh, this field from all of the clinical trials, the characterization of the RTSS protein, that is the main protein that is the circumsporozoite protein, the protein on the surface of the sporozoites, which has been, which has been used to uh, vaccinate people and get very good results. Uh, so that's a huge success story for the army. And of course, the first successful Shigella vaccine, which was that one that was made at Pasteur and that was tested here. So I'm going to leave you with this. And if you have any questions, I'm sorry, I went a little bit over time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mala, for that really extensive and very detailed history. Uh, very little of which I knew and very broad stroke. So this was very, very informative. One question I have is you uh, kind of went fast through the fact that the army was able to achieve such quick results um, because they had people, they had resources, etc. Would you just give us an example of how these this work was really done in the field, which is why they were able to uh, be so successful. So could you just give us an example? Oh, and take the latest one, the HIV vaccine. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, there was a lot of objections to getting that vaccine study done. Uh, as you know, at the time, I remember reading these articles in Science where there were people, all of the big wigs in HIV vaccine research said, we should not do this study because we'll get nothing. And the army said, no, we're going to do it. And I think they can do this because, you know, they have all these resources. Um, it is enormous to be able to do a vaccine trial in Thailand from researchers in the United States in 16,000 people. So you're vaccinating, collecting samples, uh, testing them, doing the immuno immunology in 10 different places, uh, 10 different types of immunoassays. It can be only done if there is a lot of collaboration and a lot of resources. Now, during the formation of the commissions, you can see the flu vaccine, for example, was where the flu virus influenza A, H1N1, was identified by um, Thomas Francis, but it was the DOD's interest also, because after World War I, the DOD had decided that they were going to do something about the flu, which really uh, destroy the lives of so many soldiers. So they will fund, they used to fund, and there is an army research office today also that funds research by civilians. But I think overall, the, the effect is probably less today uh, because there are so many other people who are doing similar research. But it was the collaboration, I think, between the DOD at the time and all of these great civilian scientists uh, in academia you know, they used to meet together at various vaccines. Uh, these commissions would change. Sometimes they would overlap, uh, depending upon the needs of the army. So, and, and as I said, World War I, World War II, uh, uh, they, they really inspired people to work collaboratively, which doesn't always happen so easily. So you had mentioned that the scientists and the doctors and everybody would just form a field hospital or research center at the site of the disease so that they had these captive soldiers who yes. they could test these things on very quickly. Absolutely, I didn't mention that. Besides the res resources, the reagents, the antibodies and all that, you had the military recruits. I mean, all of the vaccines were first tested on those poor souls. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that is an enormous, enormous resource that few people in the academic world can afford because it's expensive. Right. It even requires management of a kind that is not easy to do across multidisciplines. Right. We owe a lot to our military soldiers. Thank you very, very much. Any questions from the audience? If not, we've kept uh, Dr. Venkatesan here long enough and, and our audience too. Thank you for your patience. Any, any questions? I don't see anything in the chat box. Uh, so we will say thank you to you, Malavi, very much for this lovely talk. Thank you very much for inviting me, Sarsa. And I'm sorry I went a little overboard. That's, that's okay. A lot of things to say. <laughs> a lot of history to cover. Thanks. And also showing how, how, how good a work they have done. Yes. Probably better work in fighting disease than fighting wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, to our benefit. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Bye. Bye.